It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmani Pires coming to you from Baltimore. Honduras inaugurated Juan Orlando Hernandez for a second term on Saturday. The ceremony was overshadowed by widespread protests and police repression outside of the stadium where the ceremony took place. The opposition, led by former President Manuel Zelaya, who was ousted in a coup in 2009, and Salvador Nasralla, who ran against Hernandez, argued that the November elections were fraudulent and lacks legitimacy. During his inauguration speech, Hernandez promised to create jobs and to combat violent crime and rampant corruption. The OAS, they usually side with the U.S. on most matters, but right after the elections in November, they called for a re-election. The EU had also expressed their reservation about the legitimacy of the elections, but they have all now backed down, now endorsing Hernandez's government, as did Mexico, Canada, and numerous other conservative governments in Latin America. Begging the question, what is going on here? Joining me now from Tegucigalpa, Honduras, to discuss these developments is Jesse Friesten. Jesse is an independent documentary filmmaker and the director of the film Resistencia, a documentary about the resistance to the 2009 coup against Manuel Zelaya. Jesse, thanks for doing the piece this weekend on Friday night, contextualizing all this for us and also for joining us today. My pleasure. So, uh, Jesse, I understand that the opposition protests during the inauguration were really contained by police. They were not quite allowed to take place in the way the opposition had imagined. Describe what you observed. Yeah, the, the call was for people to surround the stadium and basically make it impossible uh, for the inauguration to happen, either by stopping Juan Orlando Hernandez himself from getting to the stadium, or at least by stopping other people from getting to the stadium in order to fill the seats, um, and maybe forcing the regime to to film a, an inauguration with empty seats. Um, that didn't happen in large part because of thousands of soldiers and police officers, well not in large part, completely because of that, um, that uh, they created basically a one kilometer radius around the stadium, which is located in a very central place in Tegucigalpa. Um, you couldn't go down any alley or anything without running into eight or nine military uh, heavily armed. Uh, to get to the stadium, I had to show ID three times. And one time, uh, it didn't even look like I was going to get anywhere near the stadium. I didn't, I wasn't let in the stadium. Uh, but yeah, that's sort of what the situation was. And then the reality in Honduras now is if you get together with any kind of anti-regime um, message with any group of people, they're going to break it up. Um, there's a few exceptions to that, but the vast majority of the time, that's what happens. And so that's what happened. They tear gassed. There's some pretty incredible photos down while down, I was down at the stadium. Some people were following that. And uh, there's some pretty incredible photos of, for example, people in an underground tunnel and the police launching tear gas into a tunnel uh, as people are trying to get out of it, um, get out of the tunnel. Different um, things were happening uh, around, uh, around the stadium as well that I think are actually maybe more important for us to talk about because these kinds of protests have been happening day after day and the repression of the protests is, is, is nothing new. It's going on 60 straight days of this kind of, of um, thing happening between police, military and, and people who are against the electoral fraud of November 26th. So what was happening outside the stadium I think was, was very important because uh, you had busloads of people getting off the bus and immediately being given um, food, so out of these massive food trucks and their names being checked off lists. And this situation uh, is something that people talk about all the time, is that the National Party will bring in busloads of people from poor poor communities in the outsides of uh, Tegucigalpa or even further away in order to fill the stadium. And there's a few very interesting videos that came out of uh, when the food runs out and people get really angry because um, they were promised, you can tell that they were promised food and uh, there wasn't enough food in the food truck and, and there was a few fights that broke out that people filmed and posted on Facebook. Another, uh, a picture I took that I think tells a lot of the story too is, this is widespread knowledge that not only are they given food but they're paid 
typically the numbers that people throw out for how much people get paid to go to the stadium for a day like that uh, is between 50 lempiras and 100 lempiras, which is about $2.50 or $5, somewhere in that range. And so there was a there was these women, as the buses were leaving the stadium and going down one of the main boulevards, there was a bunch of women who were standing on the side of the road waving uh, bills at the buses, saying, oh, you know, one of two things, either saying, we know they're paying you, or saying, how much are they paying you? And some of them had 20s, and some of them had 100s, and, and things like lempiras. Um, and so I, was, I was taking pictures of them, and at one point, as they're going by, this one woman is waving a 20, and a woman on the bus pushes a 500 lempira bill up on the, up on the glass. Um, and so I, I can, I'll give you guys that picture to show. But um, that, that, that photo says a lot. Um, when I posted that on Facebook, a Honduran friend said, oh, 500 lempiras, today must have been really important um, because this is, this is $25. This is a lot more than, than is typically rumored to, to be what they pay for these, these kinds of situations. And even still, when we look at the footage of the inauguration, they didn't manage to fill the stadium, not even close, but they did put the people in certain areas where the camera angles would make it look like it was full. Now, President Hernandez did call for reconciliation and dialogue with the opposition. What was the reaction to his proposal? I mean, the opposition was, was breathing tear gas while he was saying that. So, no, I mean, these, these people have, I think, we need to stop caring about what somebody like Juan Orlando Hernandez says. Um, his actions are way beyond anything at this point. And these people have absolutely zero legitimacy. I mean, to give one example, there, there's a huge, huge, massive corruption scandals, series of scandals in Honduras. And in 2015, as, I, as was in the first report, there's the massive movement of torch marches, weekly torch marches. Demanding, across the country demanding a, uh, an anti-corruption commission. And so that commission has found all kinds of stuff. They have all kinds of information on, who's, on how the system works and how the corruption works, how $300 million got taken out of the Social Security Fund, how uh, these all kinds of NGOs were started uh, to, to help um, support a public-private education system, but then none of that money ended up in the schools. It all ended up in these NGOs and then into a bunch of people's pockets. And just how, uh, how the state has been completely ransacked by the politicians of the National Party. And at the same time that they raised the sales tax in Honduras to 15%, which is absolutely devastating a lot of people in this country right now. Um, in, in all that situation, this, this anti-corruption commission, after two years of investigation, is getting very close. They started publishing some names, and they're getting very close to, to bringing these people to trial. And at that moment, the Congress passes a law. This new Congress, elected through fraud, passes a law. When they read the law in Congress, it basically kind of limits, to a certain extent, the, the powers of, of the MAXI, this Anti-Corruption Commission, and the Ministerio Publico, which is like the public prosecutor, um, to, to carry out these kinds of um, investigations. But then that little law was bad enough. But then when the law gets put into law, when it gets actually written into La Gaceta, which is when something becomes law, they change it and they make it so that these, the Maxi and the Ministerio Público actually cannot in any way um, go after anybody who's sitting in public office, whether elected or uh, a bureaucrat, whether past or present. And without a three, first a three-year investigation by the Tribunal Superior de Cuentas, which is a politically run arm of the Treasury, basically, which is all National Party appointed people. So they basically, it's a law of impunity that wasn't even the one that was read in Congress. They then changed the law before it goes into law. And within hours, there's a judge who justify or legitimizes that law by making a ruling, by throwing out a bunch of cases of corruption, based saying that this law says that these people can't be tried, because it also applies retroactively. So, I mean, th this is the kind of people we're dealing with. Um, there's, in the hospitals here, uh, people talk about El Pasillo de la Muerte, the hallway of death, uh, where people are dying in the hallways because there's no beds. And that's the situation that was created by this corruption. There's thousands of doctors without jobs at the same time that people are dying in the hallways. So the, 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 it's not hard to make the connections to what's happening in this country um, between the corruption between the incredibly poor conditions that Honduran people are forced to live under, 
um, and uh, and the political connections, right. and and then the repression. As you say, Jesse, and as others, and investigations within Honduras will reveal. Um, and in spite of the fact that uh, during the inauguration, Hernandez promised to fight corruption, just on Friday, Associated Press reported on a major new corruption scandal involving the head of the national police, the police chief, Jose David Aguila, uh, who is now suspected of having aided and abetted uh, in a $20 million cocaine deal, according to this internal affairs police report, which is still secret. And if the institutions that you're talking about and Hernandez actually uh, succeeds in dismantling the anti-corruption agencies uh, in the government now, what can you tell us about the kind of legitimacy this government will have uh, when it comes to this issue? I have not met a single person yet who's even the least bit shocked by any. And there's so many of these scandals dropping that that, uh, that it's incredible. And and I mean, and he's if that's not even a really we shouldn't even call that scandal alleged. I mean, there all the documents are out there that there was a really well known narco trafficker, uh, Wilmer Blanco, who was moving more than a ton of cocaine in a water truck. The, he was caught, he was, or his driver was caught. They were in handcuffs and they were in a police station. And the, the, the guy who is now the national commissioner of the National Police Force, recently appointed by Juan Orlando Hernandez, made a call and said, let him out, you know, uncuff him and let him go with the truck and everything. So, I mean, this is, this is and no, nobody here is surprised. And, and we shouldn't be surprised because the ethics of this regime and of many regimes in the world today, some of the ones we live under too, um, is the people who make up this regime, the only way they value themselves and the only way the world values them is how rich they are, how much money do they have. And so in a situation like this, however you get the money, it's all equal, whether it's by ransacking, that there's two ways to make money fast in Honduras because the Honduran people don't have much money. So you don't make a lot of money selling goods to the Honduran people. There's a, you know, there's a few, a few exceptions like cell phones and that everybody uses and, and things like this. But in general, the two sources of massive pools of money in Honduras are the state, which you can ransack whenever you want if you're in the national party, or cocaine and drugs. Um, this is, these are, if you want to get rich in Honduras, these are the two paths. And this is what everybody's doing that's in power, particularly those that took power in the coup d'etat, because they got away with a coup d'etat. So what's worse than that at this point? Jesse, as I mentioned in the introduction, many countries have now accepted Hernandez's legitimacy to govern, including Canada, where you're from, Jesse. Um, they are doing so even though the OS and the EU had initially reported widespread irregularities during the vote. Now, these countries and other so-called democracies are supposed to vouch for the democracy and legitimacy of these types of elections in other countries. Also, there were the statistical analysis conducted by the magazine Economist and uh, by the OAS showing that statistical impossibility of Hernandez's win. Um, given all of this, how are the people in Honduras reacting to the international legitimacy that Hernandez has now been given or is receiving as a result of being inaugurated and now allowed to govern? Oh, I mean, it's, uh, it's been, it's been kind of, I, I mean, to tell the story since 2009, I think when I would show up in protests in 2009, uh, anybody, people who didn't know me would approach me and, and be really happy, like, thank God you're here. The world's going to know. And, and then over the eight and a half years that I've been coming back and forth to Honduras and and going to events and, and talking to people, I've seen that become more and more rage filled, like to the point where now it's like, why, why aren't you telling people like, why are you guys doing this? And it's, it's a, it's a, um, there's people don't, they feel very alone, um, especially right now um, on November, where are we, November 29th, or sorry, January 29th. Um, two days after the inauguration, I mean, mo most most people are pretty depressed right now, and 
And I think that's in large part due to the isolation that they feel internationally. That said, uh, their sense of humor is incredible. I mean, the in in the in the president's speech, uh, he he Juan Orlando Hernandez's speech, uh, he said, uh, and you know, un saludo para los que están allá en Honduras. So he says, and a, and um, a salute to everybody who's over there in Honduras. And it's just like a, a mix up of words on his part, but they've all now there's just the Honduran. Facebook is just blown up with memes about like what world Juan Orlando Mendes lives in if it's not Honduras, right? Because he's sitting in the national stadium saying like over there in Honduras. So people are, their sense of humor is, is, is keeping them up. But this isolation that they feel from the international community, I think is, um, and the international community, I mean, particularly the West, sometimes we use that term. And, uh, and what we really mean is the West. And that's what props up this regime. So anybody who's listening to this, who is in Canada or the United States or any country in the EU, but particularly Germany and Spain, um, or anybody who's in Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, Israel, um, we are the ones propping up this regime. And they, even with a 15% sales tax on this very poor country, this regime would not be able to stand. It is through international aid, military and otherwise. And and be clear, some European countries and Canada and countries like this like to say, oh, we're not sending military aid. We're sending aid for food security or for education or whatever. It doesn't matter. This regime will do whatever it wants with that money. As soon as it's here, there's no accountability. There's nobody actually following up on this stuff. I mean, that money, as soon as it's in their coffers, they're going to use it to put in their own pockets or to buy uh, more supplies for the military or police force. Right. Um, Jesse, in your piece you did for us uh, that was published Friday night, contextualizing all of this, um, there was a delegation from the United States that arrived in uh, Honduras um, with some people who were a part of the Zelaya government in the past. Um, how are they being received and what uh, are they intending to do while there? I think, I think the intention if I could read it from one of the through lines, I mean, it's a very, uh, it was a very um, diverse group uh, in the delegation in terms of what sector people are coming from. Um, it was all an all African American delegation, but you know, we had Danny Glover who comes from the world of entertainment and activism, even before he was an entertainer, um, an actor. Uh, we had, um, you know, uh, James Early, an academic and former uh, curator at the Smithsonian or director of cultural studies at the Smithsonian. And we had a bunch of um, business people, an ex-mayor of Berkeley, Gus Newport, uh, city councilor um, in Sacramento. Uh, there was like, a, it was a whole diverse group, but one of the, when they would talk, all of them would talk about their experience in the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. And as, this, as, a, as a successful movement of international solidarity and them after being here for just within a few hours and hearing from people and hearing about what's going on they immediately made the connection is like that's what's needed right now in honduras like honduras is the laboratory for so many things um this is this is the right ultra right american and when i say american i mean the continent of america north south and central america and the caribbean this is the laboratory of the ultra right um, and and this needs to be, at least in our hemisphere, this needs to be the the anti-apartheid movement needs to be here. And they recognized that, um, and they constantly made references to the work they did uh, in the anti-apartheid movement. And the other thing I would add to that is a lot of people are pointing out in Honduras a lot that all the international media coverage is in Venezuela right now. Now, I have not been to Venezuela. I don't know what's happening in Venezuela. But our duty as citizens is to be aware of how we're impacting the world and then make sure we're having a good impact on the world. My government in Canada and none of all, all those governments that I listed before in Europe and Asia and North America and Israel, we're not supporting the Venezuelan regime. We are not only supporting the Honduran regime. The Honduran regime doesn't exist without us. So let's be very mindful of that. And let's put our eyes towards Honduras. And let's put our actions towards Honduras. All right, Jesse, I thank you so much for joining us today. And we're going to follow this story along with you and uh, hope to hear from you very soon again. Thank you. My pleasure. And thank you for joining us here on The Real News Network.